Evening and welcome to our very first uh, Ask the Farmer session for 2022. Um, Happy New Year, everyone. I'm Bridget Barry from Farming for Nature. And um, Farming for Nature was set up to inspire and encourage farmers that farm or wish to farm more with nature in mind. One of the ways we do this is sourcing and profiling our farming, uh, a number of exemplary farmers at our annual Farming for Nature Ambassador Awards each year. This Q&A series is a great way to learn from these farmers and find out what are their tried and tested methods for including and enhancing nature on their land. Over the next hour, I'll kickstart uh, with asking our, our guest speaker a series of questions, and then we encourage you to write into the chat box, which is on your banner, uh, any questions that you may have in relation to their farming practices or methods for farming for nature. If you missed any of the previous sessions or in, or if you have to leave early from this session, uh, these are all up on our YouTube channel and this one will be up on our YouTube channel in the next day or two. So feel free to use it um, and to share it where possible. Um, so on to tonight's event, we're delighted to have one of our more recent Farming for Nature ambassadors, uh, Gerard Maher, uh, join us. Gerard is a dairy farmer in County Limerick. He farms 80 hectares and has just 80 dairy cows. Um, Garrod is in the top 10% of suppliers to his co-op, but still farms alongside nature. So we look forward to hearing more about that. Garrod, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Garrod, you might just start with um, telling me a bit about your journey into agriculture and this farm. Well, I suppose um, I, I took over the farm in 2011. Um, it was leased out at the time. Um, my father would have been in dairy in the, the mid 90s and would have retired due to ill health and the farm was kind of leased out for a subsequent year. So it was kind of, um, I suppose, there was a lot of work to be done when I took over, you know, to, to set up in dairy. And um, I suppose it was always a, an ambition of mine that I would go back into dairy farm and, um, you know, so I had to, there was a lot of investment uh, incurred at the start to start up. And I, that was, you know, one of the main drivers of the farm was that it had to be profitable. And with the type of land that I'm farming here, it's quite heavy. It's, it's a difficult um, farm to farm due to the, the soil type. It's, it's, and um, so it's, it's, it's not for the faint hearted. So like, Everything that was done had to be done um, with, 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 um, with thought, you know, you couldn't just go and do something really nearly that. Um, so it, part of that then was, um, you know, I focused on, on, on the cow, um, that the cow was going to be the main driver of the farm. She was the one that produces the milk and that's where you get your revenue from. So. I kind of focused on a, a low maintenance, um, high fertility, medium-sized cow, which is our pure Frisian. So I have, I'm milking 80 pedigree pure Frisian cows um, on 80 acres. So it's a cow to the acre. And the reason I, I stick to a cow to the acre is because that was the old method of farming. If you could milk a cow to the acre, you know, you weren't doing too bad. But, you know, <coughs> I could, I could increase the stocking rate, but I always felt that if I, oh, I'd, um, I'd push the farm too far and that, you know, there's was, there was, there was a tipping point on every farm. And I felt that, you know, as a cow to the acre, you know, if we could produce a lot of milk from the cows that were there, um, that, should, that should be as good as having 20 or 30 extra lower yielding cows. So um, the cow was always the, the cornerstone of the farm. So just um, just with that kind of the line thread, thinking about that, the kind of the cow to the acre, like you say, it was kind of the old rule of thumb. Um, where did you get your kind of support and advice about sticking to that? Because I presume the kind of the narrative is a bit different, uh, encouraging stopping numbers. Um, well, I suppose a lot of it came from my father. Um, he he didn't he wouldn't have had a good time farming here. He he had a lot of bad health and a lot of things went wrong for him. And he was, you know, we were both conscious of the same thing happening to me here, that, you know, that um, 
things can go wrong and you know when they do go wrong it's 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 hard mentally as well as, as financially so um really we you know the, my father had a pure freezing cow my grandfather his father before him and um i felt that you know if you had to sell the cows with for whatever reason they'd, they'd still have a value your calf has a value um you know they're low maintenance cow um you know and it, it kind of um that was the main aspect of it but he would always say you know that um the weather's everything you know it's you're, you're farming the weather with the type of soil that i'm farming on you know you just have to mind it that bit more and um, you can't like I think the average stocking rate on, on a lot of farms now would be three light stock units to the hectare, while I'm only at 2.5. And like I could have, with quarters gone, I could have, I could be, with, with the platform that I have for the cows, I could be making 126 cows, but mm. I just feel that there's, when, when like you take 2018, when we had the fodder, when we had the drought, you know, it had no effect on me here. We, smed, we fed a small bit of extra feed, but not a lot. Like, um, we were never stuck for grass. So anytime there's a weather event, it, you it, doesn't, it, yeah. it doesn't really impact us here because we, we have that cushion yeah. where we have that bit of extra grass if we need to use it. You know? So can you just, um, for those of us who haven't visited the farm, can you maybe paint the picture? You were saying the kind of soil is, is it very clay-like or, you know, yeah, so have <coughs> you just, have you, is it just in fields or have you got woodland? Have you got different habitats? Are you upland, lowland? So maybe just paint the picture of yeah, what we'd be pre predominantly lowland. Um, it's heavy, it's a heavy clay soil, but it's it's good fertile ground. Like our soil fertility is excellent here. Um, so the farm is there's 80 acres for the cows grazing, and then the outside farm is my wife's farm. Um, that's that's. 60 acres and 40 acres in two separate blocks so we cut silage on the 40 acres and we um all the calves are kept till the year old and they're kept on the outside block with the replacement heifers so and on the home block here we have 20 acres of forestry of, of real marginal ground that um, um is unprodu unproductive so it, that's ready for clear filling at this point in time but the there's a bit of change of plan with that, that um, I'm going to, instead of clear felling it, we're going to take out maybe 70% of the trees and leave it, leave it as a natural woodland and let the cows graze within the woodland every, on a 30 or 40 day rotation that, because since the forest, forestry was thinned, it just got overgrown with um, briars and nettles and everything. But by letting the cows in there every 30, 40 days, You'll encourage different regrowths and and different uh, plant species. So, so you're actually a, embarking it, on agroforestry without meaning to originally, I suppose. Exactly, yeah. And if the way I look at it is, if it if it works well, I, I'd be quite happy to to extend it across more of the farm, you know, because it's it's this, you know, we're, we're, we just seem to be getting more weather, more extreme weather events there with blister and heat during the summer and. And when we get rain, it's a diligent rain, you know, and the rest of my farm, my father would have got a grant in the 80s to take out all the internal hedgerows. So we've very little hedgerows in the, on the farm internally. And, you know, we, we by having this, by having the agroforestry there, we'll, we'll act as a, a habitat for nature and for the cows. So... You know, and have you put um have you put some of the hedgerows back uh, over time or have you yeah so you we, feel you need to divide up your fields a bit more or if they've uh, yeah them? we we've i've planted kind of about 200 mature trees around the farmyard um and we've i think uh, about 100 meters of hedgerow planted and maybe we planted uh just there last year we planted 500 whips uh, dividing paddocks and stuff like that but there's so many hairs on the farm they they, <laughs> they devoured most of the trees so we have, to, we have to go back at it again so yeah yeah <laughs> scott yeah. yeah um so just uh maybe you might just start with kind of explain to us what are your inputs on the farm you're like i know you're not organic um yeah, so what, yeah. what are your what inputs do you have chemical inputs do you have yeah so um <laughs> I suppose on the chemical side of things, we we have 
or chemical fertilizer. Um, and I've been reducing that kind of for the last five or six years because with the ground being so heavy, um, our, our soil temperatures would be a lot lower than other parts of the country. So I was in a discussion group when I started farming first. And um, the advice was, you know, get out fertilizer there in the end of January and get another round out middle of February and again in the first of March. So you, you could have 70 units of nitrogen out um, by mid-March. And I felt that I wasn't getting the return that other farmers were getting. Yeah. And um, so I kind of delayed it. So another old rule of thumb was that, um, you know, you don't get growth until the daffodils die off. You know, so you need you need about 14 degrees in the air to get six degrees in the soil. And you need six degrees to get grass growth in the soil. So I, I, I stopped spreading fertilizer early. So I kind of delayed that um, until the end of March, April would be my first round. Um, and we kind of started measuring grass for two reasons. One was to cut down on fertilizer so we'd know what was on the farm because was, before I used to be blanket spreading the farm, um, because you just go off there on a Saturday and do the whole farm and you were like, yeah, that's done. We, that job is out of the way. But now we kind of, um, by measuring the grass, we know how much grass is on the farm and we can adjust in how much fertilizer we need to spread. And come the month into June, July, there's a lot of organic nitrogen released in the soil. And, you know, if you're not measuring your grass or walking your fields, you, you, won't, you won't know that that's, that grass is grown. So... We've cut out a lot of our chemical nitrogen by doing that. And when you say measure bought, your grass, how do you measure it? You go out? Well, like, it's, it's just a plate meter and it takes. So we'd work out how much grass the cows need for the day. And we know what how much grass should be in the field for the cows. So the cows are never short, just to make sure the cows are never short of grass. And I was trying to, um, you know, part of producing a lot of milk is you need to produce good quality grass and it you know you can produce good quality grass but not at the expense of the environment so like that's all down to your soil fertility you know measuring um uh the, how much grass is grown and what the growth rates are at that time and you know where how much grass will be in that field in the next 10 days if the cows aren't going to be there for 10 days you know it's, it's all part of it and i recently we changed the fertilizer spreader here because I was always only guessing how much we were spreading or where I was spreading. And I was, we have a lot of drains on the farm uh, because it's, 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 it's low, it's a low farm. So there's a lot of open drains and it's very hard. Well, I always found it very hard to know where you are in the field. And if you ever came cl too close to a drain, you'd see the, the, the fertilizer hitting the water. So I, I changed the spreader to a, a Bahnu spreader and a GPS system. And that has really, um, that's really reduced our fertilizer as well because we can pinpoint exactly how much fertilizer we're throwing out, and it's it's a hundred percent accurate. Like, um, <clears throat> when the farm for nature judges came out, I showed them the edge of the, the border, the fields, like where there was very little grass growth, and it was almost, you know, barren, and because I was able to keep the fertilizer out from the drain that distance, um. And the, the spreader is so accurate, I can go from, you know, where you'd normally spread in 30 units, I could spread five units, um, depending. On, so you're, on, so on you're spreading less, and even though there was no grass growth at the drains, it didn't really matter because the grass within the field where you needed it obviously exactly. was sufficient. Yeah. 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 And how Which do you. Was all to do with clean, it was all to do with just I was conscious of water quality and this. It's a waste farm fertilizer into the water, but with the old spreader that I had without the GPS, I just wasn't myself. I wasn't able to, to do without it. Like, you know, yeah. Well, it sounds like the units that you're using is a lot less now anyway, like, you know, and tell me, has your, like, have you planted any more grass species or anything within your grass system? Um, <clears throat> well, over half the farm is all pasture. Um, just for the simple reason, I'm not that um, aggressive into receding, but we are, we do some receding. Um, I've oversawed a, a good bit of clover into a lot of the swards. Um, there in May, we, last year we were hoping to get in some multi-species. Um, but this year now we've, there's seven acres and we're going to put in the multi-species. And if that works, 
um, we'd be hoping to try it over more the farm and that the results from what I hear from the monthly species is super. So it's um, it's exciting times. But the only drawback that I have is back to the heavy land is you know clover is a Mediterranean plant and it likes a warm climate and it likes a warm soil and I. <laughs> I have a cold wet soil, so uh, trying to get clover to grow is, is a challenge. But um, and aside from your uh, your chemical fertilizer, is there anything else that you have to use as an input in order to maintain your product, uh, productivity? <coughs> yeah, like I would have, I was I was a terror for spraying fields because I I was always going for that picturesque farm, you know, these green fields and no weeds, and I was damned with um, I was damned with ragwort, and I was spraying for ragwort every year and um, the year grant yeah I was spending yeah. for ragwort for every year mm -hmm. and um, I was kind of I was spraying the field one day and there was a pile of thistles on it and um, I just noticed there was hundreds and hundreds of butterflies on, on, on the thistles and I said to myself Jesus sure we may as well leave this corner alone so from then I kind of just I just give up on spraying because I just I couldn't get rid of the ragwort, and um, I haven't I haven't used a spray or a pesticide or herbicide in the last two or three years. So, um, and you haven't needed to. Uh, well, since since I've since I've kind of given up on it, it whether it is there or not, it doesn't seem to bother me. You know, mm. it doesn't bother the cows, so it doesn't bother me. So. And then on that, do you find are, are your cattle? Um, they're thriving, obviously. Uh, if you're producing kind of good milk and whatever, good supply of milk, um, do you kind of? Is there any kind of other additional inputs you've needed for them in order? Like, have you noticed a change for them? <laughs> yeah, like, like we do, we do. Um, sure, that's where you get your revenue with the milk and, um. Like we're not, I don't push my cows. I'm not driving my cows, driving the milk out of my cows. You know, they get, they get whatever they need. Um, but I would have, before in the past, I would have been feeding a lot of feed in the springtime because I wouldn't be getting out the grass in time. And um, I was conscious of, you know, I said, am I, am I going to make any money out of this dairy? And if, you know, if I'm going to be feeding so much feed. So I kind of started looking at other, um, uh, forages so I started feeding sugar beet and the sugar beet has had my um, concentrate for the spring and just the one thing about the sugar beet it's it's pure sugar um, you know the cows love it and um, you know once you you know once you give the cows the beet like you can see it you can see it in the bulk tank that evening like. mm. it's, su it's super feed like so like where, where I would have been feeding six kilos in the spring, I'm only feeding three kilos of a, of a, a dairy concentrate. Um, so that means, you know, there's less, you know, imported um, soya and other products from coming from South America onto the farm, while the beet is only growing 20, 30 miles away. Um, you know, it's an Irish feed. So, um, so like I would have, I would have been feeding kind of over a ton of feed before I started feeding the beet and now I'm I've that down to about 670 kilos for last year. Mm -hmm. So uh, you you import your sugar beet the, the other things you were saying they eat is they take silage but you you grow that yourself uh, and do you grow hay as well? Uh, yeah so <clears throat> the, the great thing with the um, with the pure Frisian cow again is that they need no um, maintenance feed during the winter. So I I do all bales. Um it suits it suits my farm here. We keep half the silage as good quality silage for the milk milking cows. And then the other half is traditional hay meadow. Um, where we cut it in July and we'll turn it twice and we'll bale it as haylage. And the dry cows get that and having the pure Frisian breed, you know, they somehow they'll still manage to put on condition on it. Mm -hmm. You still have to feed straw, so yeah, so um, that's all. That's all helping. You know, we'd be spreading very little fertilizer on our silage ground because, um, if we, if we were to go with the hundred units, the recommended hundred units of nitrogen, and, and we got a clear weather spell, and we, you had to go. We, you know, if 
if I had 100 units out, I might have to wait. And then if the weather broke, I mightn't get my silage. So I'd always only go out with maybe 50 or 60 units in nitrogen mm. um, for that so that I can go when the weather's there. You know. um, so that's ready. So your, your cattle are inside, obviously, for the f- four months? Yeah, four or five months of the year. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and that you're able to, like you say, you're not bringing in too much apart from you, you're buying in the sugar beet, but kind of buying it locally enough. So Yeah, well, then, you see, the, the sugar beet has 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 had the amount of concentrate bought. Mm. And the concentrate is coming, but the majority of that is coming in in a boat. Mm-hmm. So like that, surely that reduces my overall carbon footprint that I'm buying a feed that's grown over the road com- compared to buying feed that was produced in the mill in Cork and maybe it was shipped enough from South America. So, you know. And you, you mentioned there earlier that you measure your grass. Do you do soil tests as well to know, obviously you need that to know how much nitrogen or is it just yeah, from the visual of, of the no, grass? No, 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 like, like, yeah, like that's so important, soil, soil set, testing, like, you know, you're really, you're, you're shooting in the dark, sure, if you're, if you're buying a chemical fertilizer there, like, a compound of 18, 6, 12. And, um, and if, you know, if your soil fertility is, is good or your soil pH is bad, you know, it's a waste of money and it's harmful to the environment. So, you know, it's, 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 it's the foundation of the farm is good soil fertility because, um, you know, if you're spreading slurry and you're spreading fertilizer and your soil pH is wrong, um, you know, that all those nutrients are, be, are, are at risk of being lost. To, to groundwater or a runoff. So um, I'd, I'd always soil test every two years. Um, we, we, we changed over. I bought uh, my own slurry spreader there for, for, with the low emissions. Simple for the reason that this is another way I've reduced my chemical fertilizer is that I follow the cows around now with, with um, slurry. So um, but we'd always only go at a lower rate. We'd only go at 1,500 gallons or 2,000 gallons. But I could never get the contractor to, to, to do that for me because they'd always come and they'd want to empty out. If I had 100,000 gallons, they might want to empty out the 100,000 gallons that day. So like you'd all are slurry going out one day while I'm going out now little and often. Mm. So you've less pressure on the system. And, you know, even to, to, to spread... 2,000 gallons to the acre, like the speed you have to travel around the field with the low emissions, you'd, you'd, be, you'd be driving, you'd be spreading slurry as fast as you'd be cutting silage, like, you'd be, <laughs> <laughs> you know, which you never, you never see anyone spreading slurry fast, like, you know, yeah. that's one thing I've learned from, from doing it myself. Yeah. And so you were saying about the, the kind of quality of the cattle's milk, as uh, you were saying, sorry, in when they take sugar beet, you can see it immediately, the effects. Is there any yeah. other kind of, um, top tips that wouldn't to get kind of good quality milk like that you see uh, like you were talking about agroforestry earlier and maybe environmental conditions I just wonder whether you see like say during the drought that summer a couple of years ago um you know if they have shade is it different do you know what I mean is there variance like that yeah well definitely you know if the cows if the cows aren't stressed they'll perform better and you'll get you'll have better fertility in the herd but definitely grass is the number one feed. Um, it's it's a low cost, um, uh, high high value, high energy feed. And like where, where, where I kind of struggle on my farm is I have so much grass in the springtime, but I just can't get out to eat it because it's just mm. too wet. Mm. Um, but definitely if I could have the cows out early, um, that's where you get your kilos of milk salads. That's where you produce, like you're producing a lot of milk from a, from a crop that's grown itself you know and it's how you manage what you add to that what you, how you feed that crop is is you know it's it's a super feed like you know so as an outsider looking in i um i i'm down in county cork and you know you, you kind of go past some dairy farmers some farms oh, sorry someone else has started turn, being able to turn off their mute um Sorry there, I don't know what that is. Um, yeah, I was telling me, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so you, you you obviously drive past some dairy farms and you know, they just, they might have stocking rates of uh, it, what looks like a hundred cattle in a very small field with fencing and stuff like that. I mean, 
would they be giving their cattle a lot higher, a lot more concentrates than you would? I mean, supporting their cows in various ways that you don't need to um, with external kind of inputs. Um, yeah, well, yes and no. Everyone, every, everybody's farm is different, but like I'm, to be honest, I'm no different from the majority of farms, like because there's no one, um, you know, feeding their cows willy nilly, uh, wasting money, um, you know, even though the perception out there might be like in the springtime, it's different. What you're trying to do is you're trying to utilize as much grass as you can so that the next round you'll have better quality grass. So that's why you might let the cows out for a couple of hours and you know they, it usually takes them three hours to fill their stomachs so you might give them enough of grass for that three hours and they're back in again because at that time of the year it's generally cold and miserable mm. cows generally i know my own cows don't like staying out all day in that weather so you generally just let them out for a few hours and back in mm. um so at, at different times of the year but the majority of dairy farms in this country are very good at growing grass and very efficient in how much feed they feed um, now there is different systems like high input systems indoors and that but that's that's a different um, different system you know but they'd be very you know for 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 a feed uh, return ratio like you know there's very few farmers that are um, that would be feeding their cows and not not getting a return or or um, kind of you know the kind of having an impact on animal welfare you know that they'd mm. be, um... but what i'm trying to say also is uh, i mean you have 80 I, I thought it was hectares but you said acres then later uh, oh sorry they, yeah it's 80 hectares it is 80 hectares okay. yeah but the, the cows graze 80 cows acres. can only graze 80 acres so that's 32 hectares okay got it um so like would you not be tempted to double that ju uh, just to be devil's advocate here, um, why would you not be tempted to double that? If that's what the kind of conventional dairy farmer might be kind of encouraged to do? Um, well, I suppose I'm here kind of on my own. Um, I kind of, uh, there's, there's an enjoyment at what I'm doing now. And, you know, when you push the system too far, you know, the enjoyment goes out of it and you kind of run into, like I said, you get a year like 2018 and, it, it has a huge impact. Any little weather event will have a huge impact if they're overstocked. I think a lot of farmers that are overstocked know they're overstocked. And, you know, in time, they'll probably, you know, may, may decide to reduce. But um, I suppose I, you know, I often contemplated on it, but I'm, um, when the cows are happy, I'm happy. And they're quite happy with where they are, so. Yeah, that's fair enough. I'm not encouraging it, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> <it's just> no, <laughs> no. And um, uh, do you mind me asking, like the the pure economics of it? I mean, is it is it worth it to be low stock but low low input because you you don't need the kind of the extensive uh, inputs maybe that you might need if you had high stock? Um, yeah, like even even Chagas will tell you there's there's um, there's a fine line between uh, a high stock and a low stock and rate that. Um, you know, and they're kind of saying the advice at the moment is anything over 3.2, you're kind of, at, you're, you could be running into losses. So like having extra cows doesn't mean you're making extra money. Mm. And my plan was always was to have 80 extremely good cows as opposed to having 120 average cows. Mm. You know, that's, that was always my, my um, ethos. Yeah, I'm sure you and you get to know them and you know there's kind of all the other kind of like you say animal welfare about it as well. Um, and yeah. so apart from kind of uh you know managing your soil a bit better, have you seen um other benefits to nature on your farm? Yeah, like you know, it's it's a bit um I, I suppose like we we don't we don't cut our hedgerows here um for the simple reason. There's not there's no financial gain from cutting the hedgerows. And so that's why I never bothered. And you know, there's huge talk about hedgerows now and how important they are and um how they're important they are for the bees and stuff. So like it's 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 nice to know that something you're doing for uh, for a reason is is actually having a, another benefit. Um but yeah, we would there would be a lot of um like 
the amount of birds we have around the farm, even the other day we, we were out walking and there's two buzzards on the farm, a couple of sparrow hawks, which, you know, we would have never, I would have never seen them before. Um, you know, so that's definitely, you know, I know the perception at the moment with in <laughs> among the public with dairy farmers that you know it's kind of perceived that we're we're killing the environment, but in actual fact we're we're managing it. And if anything, we're getting better at managing it. Like policy, policy drove my father to taking out all the hedgerows, and now I'm at a position where I'm putting back the hedgerows. But um, you know, pe people need to realize that every we're food producers not just farmers and that everything you eat comes from a farm at some stage, mm. you know, and that, um, that we are, we are kind of doing our bit like, you know. Yeah, no, I think it's an important kind of thing to point out uh, that it's, you know, it's a, it's an important aspect of the community as well, the, the, the production line, but also, I mean, do you feel for you, the farm that you live on, it sounds like, you know, you have a lot of pride that it's a place that maybe your family being brought up on and you know it's it's a place that you feel pride amongst your community that this is what you're doing on your farm yeah well like i suppose it's 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 an identity as well as a, a vocation and you know i like i like i like looking after animals and especially you know with dairy cows the, the better you mind them the more they'll mind you um so like I've always said, uh, I need them as much as they need me, you know, so it's kind of, um, it's a mutual arrangement. Right? So the better I look after them, the better they'll, they'll look after me. So, And, you, you know, you're, you're a conscious dairy farmer, so your milk, I'm sure, is, you know, it's, it's very high quality. Do you get a, a premium for the kind of, the fact that you don't use as much chemical inputs or anything? Do you, does it get no, recognised? No, no, that's entirely up to, uh, entirely up to myself. Um, I was always just, I was always conscious of the environment. I was always um, kind of into nature and stuff. So I would have, I never really wanted to go down that road of extra cows and more fertilizer, and more feed. Um, I always felt that it's kind of, you know, let the farm manage itself. And, you know, you can, you can go too far, but, you know, if you, if you can, um, you know, if you manage your grass well, you'll increase your milk solids. The better the, the, the more milk solids you, you you create, the more revenue you make. So the higher your milk solids, the higher the milk price you get per cent per liter. So it's it's all down to the grass measuring your soil fertility. Everything it's all a link and a chain, you know. Mm -hmm. And where would you kind of say to a farmer where to start? You know, if they're kind of on the, the treadmill of at the industry treadmill, because I, I think possibly what you're saying is it's kind of quite obvious that the old rule of thumb is still stands, you know, one cow to one acre and it's still the economics of it still working. But I suppose amongst the noise of industry, because it doesn't benefit them if no one's buying their fertilizers, like where would you, you have to kind of be an outside thinker, like outside the box thinker. And where do you think a farmer can start if they want to kind of start thinking a bit more outside industry driven um, suggestions? Well, <laughs> definitely what, like, I suppose a silver lining towards the, the high, fertilizer, high fertilizer prices for the year coming, you know, that's going to be a game changer because, you know, I, I see that, I probably get shot for saying this, but I see that as a positive that um, it'll, it'll force me to reduce my fertilizer again and hopefully grow the same amount of grass and get better use of my, uh, my slurry, um, you know, um but yeah it is i like i left i left my discussion group um the time i was in it at the start simple because i couldn't hit the targets that other farmers were hitting i couldn't get the same great you know the grades and targets i couldn't i just wasn't the land wasn't able and the more i pushed it the more it blew up in my face mm. and uh, i remember there was a, <laughs> a farmer from from Cork told me he's what his father told him was he said you know he said just farm your own farm and mm -hmm. you know I always think back to that and it's very true like you know you, you can try and mimic what other guys are doing but at the end of the day I have what I have here and I have to make the best of it and, um you know I, I and that's kind of it's it, 
that's why I do what I do, you know. Um, I'm not telling everyone they should be doing it, but yeah. Um, and when you do what I can do here, like, and it, it's funny, <clears throat> the advice now for fertilizer application for heavy science is, is the advice now is, you know, the end of in the March, April, when grass growth is actually actively growing. Okay. It wasn't before, like, so. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that someone said to me, you know, it's kind of, it's important to take back control of your land. Like you say, that's kind of, kind of like what your friend down in Cork said. Um, so if, yeah, if, if you were to give farmers one top tip where they could get advice or support around making kind of small changes on their farm, where would it be? Um, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, I suppose it's kind of it's, it's it's within your peers, like it's you know, um, you kind of have to you know if you surround yourself with like-minded people, um, you know that that definitely got me to where I am today because you know I I was lucky that um, I <coughs> before I started farm and I got to work on different farms and I learned a lot from working with others and um, you know I was lucky that way. Um, but it is, it is, I will say it is tough, um, you know, because even I went to a signpost event and um, and the take home message I had from the signpost event, which is these signpost farms are supposed to be the next generation climate, um, climate neutral farms. Like, and the take home message I had from that was that I should be making more cows. Mm. So it, it, you kind of, it is, I, I do find it, tough at times you know you really just have to stick to your guns and do what you feel suits your farm it's very hard for someone to come in and say oh you should be doing this you know it's kind of like you're walking down a supermarket and you see all the fruit and veg at the end but you've got all this kind of processed food on, on the way and you're kind of they're screaming out at you with their marketing yeah it's kind of it's tough to kind of yeah like there is there is a lot of advice out there there's piles and piles of it but it's all you know um you know, I, I, I give you, like, I was told by a, an advisor one time, he says, I'm doing everything right, but I'm complicating it by feeding the beet. And I said, Jesus, the beet is the most, uh, it's the simplest thing. You know, the cows love it. Uh, they're getting, it's, it's pure energy. So once they eat it, it's, it's, it's energy that's absorbed straight away. So there's no negative energy balance after calving. Um, they're in super condition after calving. And uh, they're, 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 they produce a lot of milk off it, at, at, not at the cost of their, their own body weight. So mm. it's, the proof just, is in the pudding. Know, but the advice was to cut it out, you know. Yeah, so. yeah it's, it's, it's kind of difficult, like, you know, to, to think independently sometimes when your main advisors are... Yeah, you know, like, I'll I, I give you another example, like, the pure freezing cow. Like, you know, it's, it, she's a low-maintenance... High fort, like the fertility in that breed is, is, is phenomenal. And they're producing a lot of milk salads, but very few farmers use pure freezing cows because their figures, um, when compared to other breeds, are very low. Like they're minus for milk and they're minus for a lot of things. But uh, the proof, the proof in the pudding is on the ground. You know, I'd have very little um, vet, veterinary assistance. Um, we do selective dry cows, so we use very little antibiotics on the cows for that because it's they're, they're naturally low maintenance. But yes, if you get your your catalog of your sires, um, the pure Frisian, <coughs> there'll only be five or six at the back of the catalog. While you have all these um, high EBI um, uh, bulls that everybody seems to um, be using, and yes, there's a friend of mine. <coughs> His EBI is a lot higher than my herd, and we're both producing the same kilos of mink salads, you know, which makes no sense. Because <laughs> on paper, my cows are minus for, me, for producing mink salads. Fair enough. The proof is in the pudding. So you're yeah, yeah. Getting the check. <coughs> the... Tell me, um, do you find your kind of, do you have neighboring dairy farmers, kind of conventional farmers, or like looking over your fence going, ah, Garud, what are you at? Or do you know, are they kind of <laughs> starting to. <coughs> Yeah, we all do that. Questions. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> we all do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's that was one of the uh, when I stopped spraying my fields and stopped spraying the 
defenses and stuff. <clears throat> I knew I could see a lot of farmers kind of, or my neighbours kind of saying, oh, is this fellow now, he's getting lazy or he's, he's letting the place go. But to be honest, I do my own thing and let him, you know, at the end of the day, um, I'm saving money by not spraying and it's having a positive impact on biodiversity because you can see if you walk your along the hedgerow that's not sprayed, like the amount of bees and butterflies you'll see are, you know, you know, and if you don't have the time to notice that you won't, you won't ever take heed of it. But, um, it took you, which is there anything that you've kind of gone, I mean, you were saying, sorry about the ragworth and the thistles and the amount of butterflies you saw that day. Um, was there kind of a pivot moment for you where you went, yeah, I'm going to stick with this because this is working for me, for the farm, for e like ecologically. Was there kind of one moment that you can remember that you... Yeah, yeah, like it was that time that I was, like we had, there was a corner of the field, it was just full, there was no grass, it was just full of tinsels. And I went down with the, the sprayer and um, it was just, I just, I'd never seen as many butterflies in my life. I couldn't get over it. And I said, sure, if I spray this now, sure, they're all gone as well. So I just left it there. And I kind of gave up on it because the more I sprayed, there was more, there always seemed to be more weeds the next year. And since I've stopped spraying, I, I don't know whether it is that I don't know some anymore or don't really care about them. Um, the fields are fine. Not, there's a few weeds here and there, but it's not. As an impact as your... No, no, no you know, so... Basically. Well, listen, we're going to go over to some questions uh, <coughs> that we have got. And ever, anyone feel free to write some questions in the chat box um, for Garoud. Uh, Claire Lyons has written here, the RSPV have uh, good resources for plants, for, uh, on plants for um, like wildlife thistles are a top, top plant for wildlife and restoring soil from compaction. So there's a link there if people want to see it. And of course, uh, there's the National Biodiversity Data Center as well, resources. Thanks, Claire. Um, James Healy has written, how do you feed the sugar beet? Um, well, I keep it simple. So I have no diet feeder. Um, I just have a, a chopper on the back of the tractor. And um, I buy the beet washed. So um, it's just tipped up in the yard and we just back in the chopper and drive along with the barrier. So I'd have enough headspace for all the cows. So I guaranteed all the cows will get, get their fill of beet. So that's very important to have enough headspace. So is this only in the winter that you feed them that you like, you don't feed yeah, them? Yeah, so they, like there's enough, there's enough energy in the grass for the cows. Like I, I found with the silage, um, you know, it's it's hard to make top, top quality silage. And, um, you know, you, I, you know, you could have to, some years you might have had to feed 10, 12 kilos of a dairy ration. And uh, at, <clears throat> at 300 or 330 euro a ton, it was, it was very expensive. And so I just kind of started looking at different things. And the one thing I noticed with the beet was, um, you'd, you know, it is 50 euro a ton, 60 euro a ton, that six cent a kilo, um, you know, for the return on milk that you get, uh, it's 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 phenomenal. It's to me, it's a no brainer. But yet, the advice out there that was, I was told that I shouldn't be doing it. So mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> and then, like, do you know? Of, do you know of many other uh, dairy farmers that are using it? Um, yeah, like there would there would be like a lot of the the winter milk men now, and a lot of the. Um, Guys that would milk for the winter would would, would feed bees, um, just because it's 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 super feed for the cows, like and it's just like giving them sweets, like you know. Yeah. Um, Jeez, I wonder, if, like, if the milk is sweeter as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, it's not. I tried it. <laughs> oh really? You did a blind testing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Patrick Keeley says, "Fair play, Garoud. You're an independent. Uh, you're independent thinking and common sense. So welcome and inspiring. Continued success to you." Shona Flynn has written, Gerard, at what somatic cell count range do you use for the selective cow, dry cow therapy? Um, so the, the advice out there is <clears throat> any cow um, under 100 will get an antibiotic. Um, so I started doing any cow under 100 somatic cell count, and then I moved to 150, and I've now pushed it out to 200. So I think... There was 80 cows, I think we only did 18 or 20 this year with, with an antibiotic. Um, so, 
You did you make a conscious decision, or is just it hasn't come across your desk to, to to not be organic, or is it just it's not something that appeals? Just talking about antibiotics um, and cows. <clears throat> yeah, like I, you know, I'm kind of torn between the two. Um, you know, I there's two there's two reasons. Um, my grazing season is very short here, and organic feed prices are double what they are commercial. Um, the other reason is I'd struggle to grow the level of clover that I need for organic. And the main reason is I like I like feeding beetle, I like producing a lot of milk, and you just the organic system, you just don't produce the same amount of milk. Mm-hmm. And the other side of it then is um, the gap between commercial milk price and organic milk price is closing at the moment. And with the way the restrictions that are coming in on food production and, and herd, the herd reduction. I, I only see food prices going higher. You know, that's my own opinion. Um, because you know, it's fine to say we're we're protecting the environment and we'll reduce food production, but the, the, the demand for feed is increasing the whole time. And you know, you, you take a certain percentage of, of food food production out of the system, you know, there's going to be there's going to be repercussions down the line. So I I I don't, I don't, my own opinion, I don't see a meat price uh, ever going too low. So, mm. you know, I'd still, you know, it's still like if I was organic, I, I'd be, I'd, I'd be milking a lot less cows again. I'd be, my overall milk sales would be a lot less. Um, so, can you explain not, why to me? Sorry, I, I don't really understand why. Or, um, well, or just because you, you wouldn't have the grass pr- productivity, is it? Or? Well, you would like you no, know, yeah. You you would have to grass like grass alone will will sustain kind of 23, 24 liters of milk, um, and any anything over that then anything over 24, 23 liters of milk, uh, you know, for 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 a cow to maintain herself, she needs to be supplemented either with beef or with with a dairy nut. So the fact that the uh, the, the the concentrates organic concentrate is double the price of ordinary concentrate uh, I think is kind of dilutes the fact that you're not spreading fertilizer so you're kind of where you win you're losing on the other like you know, it's, mm. um, you know that's quite particular to your land as well like maybe someone with a slightly more productive land it would be easier to convert over yeah like so if I if I had if I had 200 acres of dry ground in one block mm. organic would be the way to go like but mm. I don't so mm. I'm fragmented um uh, it's it's the milk pays the bills and I, I have a lot of uh, there's, a, there's a nice bit of debt on the farm and it has to be serviced and, and the only way to do that is, is 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 by looking after the cows that I have and they'll you know they'll, they'll pay the bills so. so the fact you're in the top 10 percent of your suppliers to your co-op what, what does that what does that mean does that mean that you're producing more milk per cow than other or than other suppliers or just so i understand everyone else yeah like yeah it. yeah it, it, it goes on the, the it's kind of on a um, say you'd get a, a quad report at the end of the year and um the higher the higher the higher the more efficient your, your herd is the the, the 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 higher your rank so that's that's basically it in a nutshell so um that's why i'd always you know my cows did uh Six six thousand two hundred kilos of milk last year, and I know if I went to, if I swapped swapped over to an organic system, I, you know, I'd probably be down to four and a half thousand kilos, maybe five thousand kilos of milk. Okay, and interesting. That's just on my farm, like you know, I'm not, I'm not saying yeah, it's the type of farm. every organic farm is going to do that, but you know, that's that's a big drop in milk revenue, and it's it's a big drop, um, you know, in cow numbers as well. So, mm. you know, I, I it, feel that. It is interesting that you're, you know, you're obviously getting a high quantity of milk and largely down to, you know, the, the space that you give them, the, the the land that you're giving them, what you're putting in the land. So, I mean, the kind of, it's a gold stamp to kind of start to say, you know, well done, Garoud, for, for how you're doing it, I suppose, isn't it? Well, it, it, it kind of keeps, it, it also lets the farmer know how, how he's going himself. Um, mm. I suppose you're always try you're always striving to um uh, to do better. Um so like it's 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 
um, like your big solids are and, and grass grow, trying to manage grass, it, it's, it's a minefield. And the better you manage your grass, the better milk solids you have. And the, the better your milk solids are, the, the more the more you get paid. Mm. And that's 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 what it's, it's all down to, you know, um, the, uh, at the end of the day. So, Perfect. Um, so there's a, a comment here by John Fleming. Well, Dominic Road, Ma, uh, Matu, I'm telling the wife here that some people's wives come with farms. She's not impressed by me. Uh, okay, <laughs> thanks. Uh, sorry, I missed the start of the meeting. This is from James Hurley. What is your butter, fat, and protein percentage on your system? Well done. Um, uh, the butter fat um, for, for last year was uh, 4.24, and the protein dropped slightly this last year it, it's down to 3.53 um i don't protein my protein was just down low all, all last year for some reason i don't know why i think the may may was we we'd a bad month to me i'm putting it down to that i don't know um i just i struggled with protein all year so um, but you'll be hoping that to be up around 3.6 like that would be that's where it normally would be so perfect well, thanks very much, Garou. We're coming to the end here. Um, just very quickly there, um, if you were to give last pieces of advice or tips to farmers on how they can lower their inputs but kind of remain productive, what would it be on, the, on a dairy farm? Um, measure everything. Um, you can't manage something you don't measure. And, you know, if you're not... Um, you know, if you're not measuring your grass... You, you know, you're not going to produce that extra bit of milk. Um, you're not going to be. You're you're not going to know uh, how much fertilizer you should be spreading. Same with your. If you don't do your soil sampling, um, you know, you're not going to know what what the soil requires. And it's it's, it's kind of guesswork, like. Right? Mm -hmm. And so I I'd, I'd, that's what basically I do. I measure everything. And, um, I can't say it enough about like. I notice a lot of guys that are getting into dairy farm and there's a big emphasis on facilities and roadways and paddocks and water trucks and and very little emphasis on the cow but the cow is is the heartbeat of the farm and she's paying the bills and she puts food on the table and she's the one that um that that, that drives the farm so definitely i if anyone wanted advice on, on dairy farm it's definitely investing in ge good genetics mm -hmm. and have a good herd of cows and, and mind them well Mm -hmm. uh, you can't go wrong in like so uh, Kate McEnay says here I had the pleasure of visiting your farm recently and I doubt there are happier looking cows to be found anywhere else so there you go <laughs> uh, what, what is your top tip to um, apart from the genetics what's your top tip to a kind of a good happy happy cow um, well sure I suppose if it's not the infrastructure that sorry you're kind of saying that you know that people are encouraged to think about the infrastructure and the sheds and the you know the water troughs and stuff but you, you were saying about investing in the cow but is there anything else that you would kind of leave as a leaving comment on how to create the happy cow um well like it's it's it's, it's like I said it's it's it, it's like a link on a chain so it's it's a whole chain of events like you know if you're if you're um you say you might have incredible facilities and very good facilities but if you have 100 cows and you've only 80 cubicles straight away you you, you, you have a slight problem there um um same again if you um you might have you know fella might have expended cow numbers but didn't expend his infrastructure so he might he might be three or four hours milking that's a long time for cows to be standing around in the yard like they're all small things but um definitely the cow the cow is always number one and if if if, if you if you grow your farm you have to grow everything around the cow as well not just i think what happened when quarters went was extra cows came into systems everywhere but everything else wasn't ready for the cows why mm. I'd be kind of the opposite. Have ever ready for the cows before they'd come. So fair enough. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, listen, thanks very much, Garou. That was it's great to hear your about your farm and your very inspirational <laughs> what you're doing there and how you're doing it differently from lots of other people and and that it still works, which is really important. And that you know that the cows, the number one, are are, are happy as well as the 
but as well as the kind of the economics of it all is is important and then obviously ecology is that, that that's all being heavily supported and thriving throughout so well done with all your work and I wish you the best with your your new kind of um ideas around agroforestry and stuff on the farm it sounds exciting and uh, and I'm sure the cattle will really enjoy that as well so thanks very much so for anyone that um uh missed part of the session or whatever or if you know of someone who would like to see the session um it will be up on youtube in the next day or two and um you can read more about Garode's Farm up on the Farming for Nature website. Uh, the Farming for Nature website has loads of different resources and different ideas on what, how you can, you know, manage your system slightly better for nature. So feel free to, to utilise uh, the website and share it. We will hopefully have a farm walk on Garode's uh, farm this summer. We'll, um, we'll let you know if and when we do, um, kind of COVID allowing, that we will have that. If you have any questions, um, we have an online forum which uh, farmers uh, plug into and answer. So feel free to have, if you have any questions uh, around your farm or anything, do do that. Our next um, Q&A session is on Tuesday fortnight time uh, with Louis McCauley um, and he's a tillage farmer that has changed from being an intensive tillage farmer to kind of going towards more biological farming. And he has um, 1400 acres over there in County Mead. So he'll be our next uh, speaker. So Garud, thank you very much again. Thanks for yep. joining us. And uh, it's been a pleasure to speak to you. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, and we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. <coughs> Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.